My Gavan and Melonine, and well met indeed. I'm Arakir Galadirathan, head of the modding team behind Divide and Conquer, and welcome back as we give you another developer diary as we close in on the ever increasingly closer date for version 4. This um, developer diary has various bits and bobs to go over, but nothing ground or earth shattering because, of course, we are getting close. Um, so, with no doing at all, other than that, let us jump in. So the first thing I've talked about a little on um, in YouTube campaigns, and that is that the AI will now only attack you when it outnumbers you at least a little bit. So um, in actual numbers, the AI has to outnumber you um, 1.2 to 1 times, uh, if that makes sense. So if you've got 100 people, they won't attack you till, for very basic argument's sake, they've got 120 people. And this, in testing, and we're very grateful to Orc Lover, one of our long-time beta testers who brought the idea to us, and in testing seems to have worked. The AI now... Now, it doesn't solve the AI's problem. This is an old game. But the AI will now actually try and group its armies together, and no longer will it throw small captain armies around at you. It will actually try and build an army that will defeat your own army. So there should be less um, smaller stacks or fewer smaller stacks roaming around and um, you should get more impactful battles. So that is fairly good. Secondly, Hummingbird has gone through and edited all of the last stand army compositions. So when a nation, and this is specifically the last ones they get, so when they drop down to less than three provinces on average, for some nations it's one province and or etc. But when they drop down to that amount, they get a last army which helps keep the AI alive. I know a lot of people don't like this feature, but without it, the AIs just simply... So many of them die off so early, they can't um, stay alive. Whereas this just gives them a bit of a bit of a bit of pep. Um, and everyone knows about it by now, so we keep it in. And it has been amended so that every army is now fairly even across the board. So you won't go from facing, for example, against Imladris, you won't get a horde of just pure Imladris elite units that will absolutely annihilate you. You now get a spattering of units from across their entire roster, which is a little more thematic, and you now know a little better about what you're up against. There will always be a single full banner army, and it now just has a nice variety of troops in it. So they are arguably, on the whole, all of them are now slightly more challenging than they were before. Uh, but at least they are all now the same. Uh, Rohur has now made has cut down a lot of the command star available traits, which means that it is now a lot harder for your generals to gain these command stars. Um, and so... They are now more impactful. A, a rank 10 general will now actually be a properly rank 10 general, if that makes sense. Um, and it shows that they have earned their stripes. No longer will you just get rank 10s left, right and centre. They now actually have to show that they are worthy of that stat and, and they're, they're harder to get the command stars. Although I just noticed that something I'm about to talk about has not actually taken effect and I think it's because I need to regenerate the text file in a different way. But anyway, that's irrelevant. Um, merchants are being returned to the game in a very small scale. So they will train from the level 2 and level 3 merchants guild, which means that the nations that actually get a Merchant's Guild, you will only ever have one, or possibly, if you're lucky enough to get the headquarters, two locations in the whole world that train merchants. So they are really very, very rare. They're being returned because it does make sense to have merchants for certain factions, because we do have a lot of factions that have a merchant-based theme. So they come from the level 2 and 3 guild. They can only be trained by factions that actually get that guild. And off the top of my head, that is Dorwinian, Bree, now um, added Harad and the Ardenaim. So both of those as well. So Dorwinian, Bree, Harad, Ardenaim, I believe Dale. And I think possibly that is it. Unless Gondor and Dol Amroth do as well. I can't quite remember. But certainly Dorwinian, Dale, Bree, Harad and the Ardenaim, I know for certain. Um, because those are the key trader nations, if you will. Although, um, Bree and Darwinian are the key trader nations, really. But anyway, they all get merchants now. Um, Darwinian actually have the opportunity, being the trader nation, to get an extra merchant if you choose the human path. It comes from the Darwinian Wine Depository. Uh, and um, so the, the Northmen Unique Economy Building if you side with the Northmen, now also gives you an extra merchant. So Darwinian at any one time would likely 
I could possibly have three merchants if they get their headquarters. Bree also get an extra merchant if they choose the mercantile route rather than the Dunedine route and it comes from the Prancing Pony in Bree. So again, another merchant that Bree can get. Um, and then I say AI and Harad, uh, AA and Harad have also been added, but they can't get a level three guild. So for the Ardenaim and Harad, you will only ever get one merchant. Now, if you're unfamiliar with merchants, just a very brief description of what they do. They are an agent, much like the diplomat here. And all you do with merchants is move them onto a resource like the apiary standing to his west, stand them on top of that apiary, and they just give you an extra tradable income. The, m the, the more... Oh, I can't think of the word, I mean. The resources that are worth more, <laughs> is a long way of saying it, such as gold, for example, or if you really want the best resource in the entire game, if you can get a merchant onto it, is, of course, Mithril, which is up there on that mountain. I don't think you can get a merchant onto that, so we'll ignore that and we'll return to the gold. Um, if you stand on gold, you'll get more money. Um, merchants can be removed by other merchants, so you can buy off merchants, you bribe them out of existence. I don't know if they join you or if they leave the game altogether. I think they join you, so you could possibly get more merchants, but you wouldn't be able to train more than one per building, for example. So, to have a merchant empire, you're really going to have to get a good merchant out there and get lucky on your bribes. Remember, there are no assassins, so you can't kill merchants by that doing that. But merchants have no negative effect on other factions other than bribing their merchants. So all they really do is they might take away a little bit of your income, but that is it. So that's why we're happy for them to come back. Assassins are so frustrating and they will not be returned. They just don't work well in this setting. And to have someone like Boromir, for example, a level 10 general, the best general Gondor has, and then there's a 5% chance that some absolute nobody assassin from Mordor can off him, it just ruins campaigns. And I myself, in fact, part of the reason assassins are gone are because of that almost exact fact. Lord Imrahil, many, many years ago, when I was first in the modding team, when I was first rising to become the head of the mod and could make these kinds of decisions unilaterally, um... Imrahil was assassinated in Cannes, and he was my greatest general at the time, and it drove me up the wall. I was like, no way could an assassin get into the camp of a 3,000 strong Amrothian army. It just drove me up the wall. Um, so anyway, assassins won't be coming back is just trying to cut off any questions about that. Um, there was a glitch that we've recently discovered has been fixed with the AI population growth in, I think, towns or large towns? One of the two. What does a felon start as? A city. Cities. Um, the, the, for some reason, there was an insane bug, or it's an overlooked piece of script, really, where um, the AI got a 12% population boost in certain towns. Um, and so that has all gone. So now the, all the AI's population will be similar to yours. So no longer will you come across a, a, an AI town. So you've held the town since the beginning and the AI has held the town since the beginning. They won't get any bonuses to population that you also don't get. So you won't come across any more towns with 60,000 people in. Um, and your town has only gained 200 since the start of the game. That just won't happen anymore. Um, also, there was a population growth bonus that was tied to the difficulty level and we've stripped that out as well because it just seems nonsensical and and unnecessary so that has gone as well so now you and the ai are on the same terms when it comes to population growth which is good um Roher has also added a basic supply trait mechanic um which if memory serves, um, I've asked him to detail this in a little more further, and a little further, sorry, and I'll talk about it possibly more in the next developer diary where I've got more info. But generally speaking, it just means that in your own territories and in your own town, it has no effect whatsoever. And when you are out on campaign in another province, it takes something like five or six turns to actually negatively impact you. And all it does is slightly slow down your movement speed and something else as well, possibly your combat effectiveness by a little bit, or, or it may have been actually your medicinal supplies after battles so if your supplies are low you will recover less um, troops at the end of the battle or you will sorry you will recover fewer casualties at the end of the battle which again um, I do quite like that to be honest even in, in a small part it's another one of those nice sort of realistic -y kind of things um, that, that is let's be honest if you don't have the supplies there are people there are going to be people who would die who otherwise wouldn't have died um, and, but it, it is only a very simple script and it's very easy to ignore because our provinces are so small. So it's unlikely you're going to be campaigning in another province and to 
for more than, say, I think it's six or seven turns or something like that. Um, before it even has an effect. Now, there's a couple of stages of it as well. Additionally, Rohur has also added a simple sort of Dwarven Grudge script, but again, I don't actually know anything about this other than there are key locations in the world where if you're playing as Erebor or khazad there's a little bit of an incentive to retake them because they will have Dwarven artifacts in them. Um, and he's taken key artifacts from history, which I really quite like. Um, so, for example, he suggested that the Horn of Helm Hammerhand was in fact a... Um, a gift from the dwarves to the Northmen, who then lost it to Scatha the Worm, um, where it was then reclaimed by Fram and then passed down the line of the Northmen all the way to Helmhammerhand, where it is now in the Hornburg. And so it's a simple little feature whereby if the dwarves then get the Hornburg, they reclaim this great artifact. And it just has little bonuses like that. And he spread that out around various towns around the world, mostly dwarven towns. So Danes Halls, Gundabad, Moria, places like that is the only information I have on it at the moment. Again, I should have more in the next developer diary, um, whereas Rohu is going to type out a little bit of a description for me. And, uh, uh, the AI, oh sorry, the AI as Mordor now get a smaller cash infusion when they fall below zero gold. So at the moment, if you are unaware, the AI can never go bankrupt. When they do go bankrupt, the game gifts them about 500 gold coins or something like that, maybe 250. Um, I can't remember how many it is, but it gives them a bit of money. I say the game, it's a script we can remove if we wanted, but the AI has no concept of financial planning and it constantly bankrupts itself. So in order to keep them as a challenge, you have to keep the AI in the black. And Mordor now get a smaller infusion than they did before, because Mordor frequently bankrupts itself and um, they needed less. They needed less um, money given to them in that bankruptcy to, to, to because they um there, there was a long discussion about it but it was some time ago because i've left it too long to do the developer diary but don't tell anyone and i can't quite remember but anyway more dogs just get a bit of a smaller amount of money so mordor should not have overwhelming stacks after stack after stack and actually when they do run out of money it will feel a little bit more like they have run out of money they won't feel like the constant machine that they are at the moment um, as Gondor, Faramir has been moved back into Henneth Anun. There he is. And Carandros is now held by Hjorin. And um, Westos Gileath is now held by Captain General Boromir. And the additional general who was added, who was called Bordir, I believe, has been cut from the game. Um, and Hurin was just moved up there, as I say. Uh, Boromir previously was in that fort. So we've just moved him into a keep and then we can get rid of Bordir. Uh, because the AI doesn't take Henneth Anun as much, so Faramir does survive, so he can go back in there. A big change, or a, I never, I don't think I've actually ever gotten them, but um, a change to the Oathbreakers are that, uh, is that, you only now get a single unit. And that is the king himself. So the king of the dead's bodyguard is the only Oathbreaker unit you now get. And this is to circumvent the rather unfortunately obvious glitch and workaround in that if you simply separated the Oathbreakers out and took the two standalone units away from the king's army, then they would never disband. The king would after his three battles, but the others wouldn't. Because you can't monitor standard units, you can only monitor generals. So now there is only the general, there is only the king of the dead. Um, but do note that his bodyguard is more than powerful enough to wipe out the 20 of the game's strongest units, sans possibly the Balrog. Um, but for example, the King of the Dead versus 20 of Imladris's best, he would still win without taking any losses. The Oathbreakers are totally indestructible. There is simply no way of killing them. I mean, if you had an endless battle, you would eventually kill them because we can't actually make them... Uh, um, invulnerable but they have an insane number of hit points and a ridiculous defense and everything they are designed to be the most overpowered unit in the game but you do now only get them in two or three battles and then that is it they will go so you've got to pick and choose where you fight and make sure they don't get attacked by anyone because that will count as a battle so um, you've got to keep them safe till you need them um, all Enidwyth units now have a max recruit pool of two, which has gone up from um, one in the level one and level two muster ground. So Enidwyth might put up a bit more of a fight now they have a few more troops out there. The replenishment rate of their units has also been increased, which is good. Uh, the Isengard Berserkers no longer get their anti-cavalry boost. Isengard has so many anti-cavalry options, giving it on the Berserkers as well was relatively unnecessary. And there's nothing really about Berserkers that suggests they would be good cavalry counters, so that has been cut. And the final thing to talk about on the campaign side is that the Renown and the Command traits 
have been renamed. And this is what I was talking about earlier, where it doesn't actually change there. But um, the uh, it's Acumen, sorry. Acumen and Command have now been changed. So Command is... You will know that um, from one of the previous developer diaries, these were changed anyway. And now Acumen is actually how good is this person at being the governor of a town. And the higher this stat, the more effective he is at stopping corruption, increasing trade, things like that, and authority uh, and order. And command is purely a military stat. Um, so the higher the command stars, the more morale I think your troops will have. And of course, the more morale they will lose if he were to die. But... Um, Previously, Acumen was totally unused. Authority, I believe, is being reworked as well because authority actually has no bearing because nobody ever breaks away. No one is ever disloyal. No one ever... Um, what am I, after? am I after? Defects? That's probably what I mean. No one's in bribed zone exists, so that's all ir irrelevant. And, um, and I can't quite remember what Renown does. But anyway, Acumen and... Um, oh, no, sorry. It is Renown and Acumen that have been reworked, not Command. So, Renown and Acumen have been renamed. The tooltips have been changed. Um, and... I can't actually... Re Sorry, I'm, I'm, <laughs> I'm delaying this. So, Command is Military Star. Acumen is Governor. And I believe Renown is also Military Performance, but it affects this person specifically. So, the higher his Renown, the, the stronger he actually is as a general, as a unit, if memory serves. Um but I can't quite recall. But anyway, the tooltips have been changed and um, they now read as follows. So 0 to 10, 0 to 10. And uh, um, feedback is, is welcome if you wish to give it, but I thought I'd read them out because um, many people won't even see or read these really. So it's worth just noting them. So if we start with Renown first. Renown, of course, this is the military accomplishments. So if you're... So 0... Infamous amongst the men because he lost a battle of wits to a one-legged chicken. Should, uh, renowned too. In his last battle, he at least got the men to run in the right direction. Renowned three. Whilst eager, this man is yet to truly prove himself on the battlefield. And four. A few skirmish wins under his belt and something of an up-and-comer. At five points, a competent general. Not beloved by the men, but not hated either. Oh, hello. There we are. That is showing. Oh, they are working then. Oh, that's good. Um, and then... Uh, so that's at four, sorry, not at five. So then at five, a life-size statue has been erected in this man's hometown. They at least are proud of his military accomplishments. And at six, a solid general with a keen grasp of the ways of war. At seven, this man has been lauded for his military skill for so long he is thinking of starting an academy. And at eight, a dependable and beloved general who commands with an iron fist. Nine, a master strategist, soldiers from every corner of our realm wish to serve under him. And finally, a ten renowned general, one of only a handful of generals who can liken themselves to great generals such as Ionwe and Gothmog. So those are the ten renowned. It used to be called chivalry, it is now renowned. And then lastly, acumen, which used to be called piety. These have been reworded as well. And remember, this is governance, governance and how good they are as a governor. So at no points... It helps that this man is illiterate, because that way he can't read the reports of how shockingly bad at governance he is. At one, the horse this man rode in on is frequently asked to make decisions in his stead. At two, with a keen grasp of single syllable words and a command of counting up to 100, here is a governor in the making. And at three, the people have stopped burning this man's belongings when he pops to the shops. At four, aided by some solid public speaking skills, this man has started to garner a grasp of rulership. At five, a competent ruler, neither hated nor loved, simply tolerated. So he has four, so he should say grasp of rulership. Yep. At six, the townsfolk have been heard to use this man's name in sentences with the words success and good job. At seven, the city square fills to bursting when this man takes to the stage. He is universally loved as a ruler. At eight, a small cult has gathered around this man and they are one tax cut away from outright worshipping the ground he walks on. At nine, it is said that Fenafin often visits this man in dreams to ask for advice on city governance. And finally, at ten, this man could turn the pits of Angband into the halls of Tyrion inside of a week. He is one of the finest bureaucrats in Middle-earth. 
And there we are. So those are the new Renown and um, Acumen little tooltips, so if you ever come across them. Um, hopefully that gave you a little um, joy this afternoon. Now we shall turn over to the minor changes to um, units. And then the end of this developer diary, I will, for those of you that wish to listen to, I will um, read to you the story I wrote for Leofric, Leofric the Bowed, one of the new Nazgul names and backstories. But that is, will, as I say, be optional at the end. But for now, let's turn to the battle map and the changes we have there. Welcome then to the battle map. So we have changes for Rohan, Rune, Enidwaith and Dunland. And we shall start with Rohan who stand before us. And this is that a hummingbird has gone through every tier 1 and tier U 2 unit and given them slight variations in their design. So Rohan has had a little bit of a change in their aesthetic. Um, particularly at the lower tiers, or indeed only at the lower tiers. So here we have a unit of Yawling Axemen and um, un unupgraded and upgraded on the left. And you will note that they just now have... Um, I Obviously, I should have really recorded what they look like before, but in your current game you'll see what they look like before. Um, but they've just been changed a little, so that all of Rohan's Tier 1 and Tier 2 don't now all look the same. So they don't all look... The yeah, I've used all too many times. But anyway, there's Yawling Axemen and um, there they are on the right. Um, they have capes to begin with, and they have capes when upgraded. There's also Yawling Spearmen now, and you'll note this sort of leather design that has come in, which contrib um, contributes toward their overall design. And then when they upgrade, they get that sort of scale, Damala, I don't know. Someone will tell me in the comments, with a lot of detail, I'm sure. And then Peasant Militia, which someone suggested renaming to Yeoman, and I, I was quite tempted with that, but I, mm, I'm not sold yet. But anyway, they have been also given a little bit of a design, so now you really know this is your basic Tier 1 unit. It has basically no armour. A shield and a spear and a helmet is all he's going into battle with. But then when you upgrade them at a blacksmith, they do then get some kind of protection. And it's the same for what were the Scouts and are now Peasant Scouts, um, they also have a similar theme, although you will note they don't have an upgrade at all. They look the same whether upgraded or not. Um, and we also have Yawling Archers who follow the same pattern. So just a bit of a change in what they look like to start with. Um, and then I did have a unit of Aered over here, but I don't think they were changed. Um, they all upgrade to have that same sort of upgraded armor, so you have a nice uniform army. But they look um, a little different from the units beneath them. But anyway, just some minor changes to Rohan to complement... Um, not to complement, really. Just some changes to Rohan because they've been long overdue. Also, for Rune, only um, very minor, minor, minor changes. The Lok Gamp Rim have now got a new upgraded look. So this is what they look like before they upgrade. Um, with the gold up their legs and in their chest and covering their groin and their arms and then when they upgrade they look a little bit more like the Dragon's Wrath Guildsmen. So they go from having um, just sort of plating on the legs to a full skirt if you will, um, shoulder padding and uh, I think that's about it really. Yeah, uh, so they just get a visual upgrade, which is good. The Loke Flag Rim, this is what they look like when upgraded. They, to keep them in line with the Loke Gamp Rim, have been given this look when not upgraded. So previously the Flag Rim, which is the Mace and, um, or Axe and Shield unit, they used to always look like this, despite being of a slightly lower tier than the unit that actually looks like this. Oh, there are some maces in there. But anyway, now to keep them in, in line and, and with the same with the Gamp Rim, they now have a, the same unupgraded look. Then we turn to Dunland, which we'll come back to Ended White, because theirs is the only new unit. But we look over to Dunland, where Wolf's Pikes and Wolf Swords have been given just a little bit of an overhaul. You'll note there's a few little accessories dotted here and there, like some shoulder pieces. Um, I think they maybe used to have capes and they don't anymore. Some of them are now wearing gloves where they didn't before, I think. Anyway, they've just had a few accessories dotted around. This guy's wielding a dagger now. There's a horn on that gentleman's waistline. So they've just got a little bit more character to them. There's a bit more going on with their design. They are no longer just a walking piece of chainmail. Um, so very minor changes on the battle map, I am afraid. But it's because we really are coming to the polishing stage, which we come to before the release of every uh, major release of the mod. And that is where new features are now few and far between and polishing is all we really have left. But there is one new feature which we are showing off to you here, and it has of course come to us from um, Rome 1. 
No, Rome 2, sorry. I forget that Rome 3 is, uh, is the latest of the Rome line. Uh, and that is a war wagon for Enid Wythe. Much requested because Enid Wythe has a very Britannic theme. And now they have it even more so because the chariot is literally taken from the Britons in the Rome 2 game. Uh, and it is a javelin-wielding, body-piercing, armor-piercing javelin chariot. So they are relatively good, but remember chariots inherently in Med 2 are actually very weak. Because whilst what you're looking at is two horses and a cart, what in truth the game has created is a large block. About this big, um, although it's slightly less smaller on, of course, at the front there. And it's a block along here as well, but just look how wide this unit is. Absolutely huge. And so remember, it can take hits from so many people that they do die very quickly. Chariot's strength comes in skirmishing and not getting shot by arrows. And also charging through units. Because the minute you let them actually hit the unit, they will almost certainly perish. Um, and, and die very, very easily. Because remember, they are elephants is the point I'm making. So even though they might look like horses, it's why they run with such ungainly strides because they are technically elephants. But they are very good javelin throwers, as you would expect, because they're Ennard Wythe. Um, and a body-piercing, armor-piercing javelin is very, very deadly. And those low like Gamprim, I mean, what, about six javelins hit them, and almost every single one took either one or two people down. So, now remember, there aren't very many of them, but they have slightly more ammunition than a normal javelin unit, because they are on a chariot, so they can take more stuff with them. There's two people that throw per um, chariot, I, I think. The front person is a driver, so even though he looks like he might throw, in truth he won't, because he is used for steering. But they're actually using it as they're supposed to. That's very rare for the AI to do something they should. This one over here is cutting back as well, pulling up to throw their own javelins. So that is all of the changes going into version 4, but as I say, for those of you that are now interested, I will keep the camera, I'm afraid, in a single location um, up high, which means it won't be all that interesting, and I shall just read the story that I've written for Leofric the Bow, the new Nazgul. So if you're not interested in that at all, then please do uh, tune out. Thank you very much for watching, and I hope to see you all again in um, whatever video is next on the channel. But for those of you who are interested, this is the story of Leofric the Bowed. Leofric was born into a simple life, and for all the years of his youth he lived the life of his forefathers, as a shepherd in the vast plains of Ravanian. He grew tall and strong, and he was contented. As tradition dictated, when Leofric was ten, his father gave to him his first sword. A sturdy blade of simple steel forged by the smithies of Galamesburg. Leofric quickly set himself apart with the sword and proved to be something of a natural. Far more than that, though, he possessed a skill with the blade that none in the north had seen in living memory. In time, his fame as the untrained swordmaster spread, and eventually challengers came to test their mettle against this wonder boy from the plains. Ten more long summers passed, and his fame and strength grew and grew, until there was none left to challenge him. But little did he know that by far his greatest challenge was already mustering to the south. To begin with, none knew from whence they came, and worse still, None expected them. They were horrible, vile creatures that lolloped across the ground with ungainly, clumsy strides, snarling and biting as they came. They fell upon the towns and camps in the dead of night, and their skin was blackened and charred, as though they were created in fire itself. The Northmen swiftly came to call them the Burning Death, but the Elders knew what they were. They were orcs. Their presence in the north was more than just petty raiding parties. A vast army had been sent from the south to enslave the hardy northmen for the machinations of the Dark Lord. At this time, the northmen had no king, and they lived in small townsteads or as farmers and nomads on the plains, going where the herds led them. In times of strife, their elders, with no central figure to rally behind or to give hope and guidance, panic spread amongst the north like wildfire. There were many strong warriors amongst the Northmen, but without a captain or a strategy, they couldn't hope to hold back the rising tide. All was to change, however, when the burning death finally came upon Leofric's homestead. By that time, he knew of the orcs well. Everyone did. He knew it would only be a matter of time before their plundering attacks brought them to his home. He had made ready. He began by teaching any who could wield a blade the art of swordmanship. Young lads, old farmers, staunch wives, tall sons and brave daughters all. 
First, the peoples of his homestead, and then his neighbours, and then their neighbours, and beyond. It was not long before word spread that a champion had risen in the north and was assembling an army to end this plague once and for all. Hundreds flocked to his, be to his homestead to fight by his side or to learn from this master. Leofric spoke to each and every person who came to his home and they found him in hope. They found in him hope. Hope that the dying ruins of the north could be born again under a brighter star. Admiration for Leofric grew strong, and his simple homestead grew into a ramshackle and makeshift city. The elders who had been forced to seek refuge with Leofric came together and resolved to see the north return to glory. They called to Leofric in the dead of night, and before a crowd of some 10,000, they proclaimed him Leofric I, King of all Northmen. News of his coronation spread wide, and in time this news came on the wind to the orcs themselves. The orcs had grown fat from easy victory after easy victory, and they were complacent in their victories and successes. They underestimated the Northmen and thought nothing of this upstart king, and marched to meet him with little concern. Leofric proved not only to be a man of the people, however, a warrior of honour and a true son of Rovanian, but also a master tactician. His armies dealt an earth-shattering blow to the orcs, and the ripple of this defeat was felt in the heart of Mordor itself. Leofric and his army then scoured Ravanian, gathering more supporters and scattering and slaughtering any orc that came before their path. His success threatened to boil over into a very crusade against the home of this burning death, with Northmen from all of Ravanian crying out for vengeance. Instead, their cries were challenged by the most feared being of all, Sauron. Riding north with an army numbered in the hundreds of thousands, come to put down this upstart king once and for all, Sauron met Leofric's army in the very heart of Ravanian. There he called on Leofric to meet him in the field in single combat, and Leofric met the call. He stood before the dark visage of the Lord of Shadow and he did not waver. Sauron felt the power, strength and honour of this man, however, and in his mind he saw an opportunity. He spoke to Leofric. I see you have earned your reputation as King of the North well, boy, but your advisers feed you untruths. I come here not as conqueror, but as ally. Your command of your people is to be commended, and I see in them a strength I never thought possible. Further bloodshed here would be folly. I offer you a simple exchange. My army will disband, return south, and not trouble your land or your people again, and you can live in peace. In return, I ask only that you accept this simple ring as a token of my esteem, and wear it always to remind you of our accord here today. What say you, Leofric? Leofric did not speak. He looked out at Sauron's gathered horde and the threat that would forever reside to the south of his land, his ancestors' land, but more importantly, his people's land. He was resolved, and silently he raised his arm, his hand widespread. But suddenly he clenched his fist and in an instant the sky was darkened with the black shafts of the Northmen. Leofric's forces were gravely outnumbered, but the orcs, even those led by Sauron himself, could not hope to contend with the storm of precise arrow fire now whistling toward them. Thousands of the enemy were cast down in the initial volleys, but this was not their first battle, and the orcs quickly regrouped and raised their shields high. Then, to the sound of a hundred clear ringing horns, they mastered their fear and charged into the waiting lines of the Northmen. The battle was bloody and fierce. The orcs had met a challenge in the Northmen that would not be easily overcome. Leofric watched on, pride swelling in his chest as the orcs fell to the stalwart defenders of the North. For every man who fell, five orcs would fall with him. Confident, he turned his gaze back to Sauron. The tall figure before him showed no signs of outward emotion, nor to Leofric's dismay, any obvious weakness. Sauron began to close on Leofric, and where before he had been unarmed, a great mace now cut through the air at his hand. The head of this ghastly weapon was as large as a pig, and would crush Leofric in a single blow. He drew his sword, gave a thought to his forefathers, and charged forth in silence. It is said the fight between Sauron and Leofric rent the very earth about their feet and sent flames high into the sky. Sword and mace both wielded effortlessly and with grace. Neither opponent showed a sign of dropping or made any mistake. They fought for what seemed like hours, 
until Sauron, Sauron was finally able to strike a powerful blow into Leofric's left leg. He crashed to the ground and all his hope and thought of victory crashed with him. His leg was broken. It took all his strength to kneel upon his other, lest he show weakness before his men. Sauron had won, and Leofric, head down, waited for the end. But it did not come. Instead, a simple, clear voice whispered in his ear. Take this ring, Leofric. Take it and wear it ever after, or I will cleanse the north of every living thing. This decision I give to you, your people or your pride. Leofric knew his lands would never truly shake the threat of Mordor, but he couldn't allow his people to perish here. He couldn't allow his ancestors to be forgotten. He raised up his hand with an outstretched finger and bowed his head low. At that time, Sauron gave a sign to his bannermen, and a loud, clear horn rang out from the orcish rank. Suddenly, the orcs retreated en masse, and all of the gathered Northmen still standing could see, in the centre of the field, their king, Leofric I, bowing to Sauron. The Lord of Shadow placed a simple golden ring upon the kneeling king's finger, and to the bewilderment of the Northmen, Sauron gave a short bow to Leofric before turning and walking away. His army fell in line to his sides, and with that the orc incursion in the north ended for good. And so it came to pass that the mighty King Leofric I of the Northmen became King Leofric the Bald, and fell to the power of Sauron. And so, while my army fights on, that is the first of my little stories for the Nazgul and the the uh, creation I have made. Of course, at this time, Rohan does not exist, not even a thought. Ravanian is, doesn't exist. The, the Northmen haven't moved to the Anduin yet. The Northmen are a fledgling society that live in Ravanian, and we know nothing about them. So I've taken the opportunity to make Leofric their first king, and unlike the rest of the stories where the Nazgul will become powerful because of Sauron, Leofric um, is going to be one of the few who was powerful before Sauron. Um, so I do hope you enjoyed that little tale. Um, obviously in various places I, I messed up the, the telling, so it may not be strictly as it was actually written. But I do hope you enjoyed it. And I hope you've enjoyed this developer diary overall. Oh, I didn't give my army any orders. But that is going to be it. So until we speak again, dear friends... Navarre and Adenpera Bad Melodine, and farewell.